Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Welcome to worship this morning um, for the South Hills Partnership. Um, it is good to be with all of you today on this fifth Sunday in the Easter season. For announcements today, um, a few things. Bible study is ongoing on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Um, and you're welcome to contact me or Dave Smoyer from Fairhaven Church if you'd like to be involved in that. Um, we just finished up the book of Ecclesiastes. We're one chapter into the book of James. Um, Ecclesiastes, you know, pretty heavy book. James has been a lot of fun um, jumping into the New Testament, something a little lively in this time. So we've been we've been really enjoying James so far, and we'd love to have you with us. We're doing it via Zoom, so it's also just a good time to get to talk to people, um, to see faces you haven't seen in a while, um, as well as just to share prayer requests towards the end, which is something I know has been has been really on a lot of our hearts recently. Um, second is in. Uh, and um, as another opportunity to pray together, Pastor Diane is hosting prayer calls on Tuesdays and Thursdays via Zoom and also via phone. Um, you're welcome to join in that as well. Um, contact her if you'd like to be involved there. And finally, um, something that has been on a lot of our minds and I'm sure has been on yours as well, as the state changes and moves through the different stages of the coronavirus response. Um, Allegheny County is expected to move to yellow next week um, on the red, yellow, green scale, um, which is still fairly restrictive. Um, no groups over 25, lots of safety measures put into place. Um, the Western PA Conference has given some guidelines out to churches for how we're going to reopen whenever that time comes. Um, we're encouraged not to open during yellow and to wait till at least June 1st for Sunday services to resume with safety measures in place. That said, we were kind of the place where we could start considering over the next few weeks um, having a small in-person component for Bible study, maybe beyond, who's to say. But as for church, let's hope and pray for early June. Um, Things will look a little bit different for a while. There will be all kinds of safety measures in place. But the light at the end of the tunnel is is present, and the churches have begun to think about what it might mean to reopen in this climate. So get excited about that. Pray that we can do this responsibly, do it well, um, and that we'll be able to see each other again in person soon. There's more reopening guidelines on the WPA UMC website. Um, I, if you click the bulletin that I have linked um, and shared a few minutes ago, uh, the conference guidelines are available there, um, as well as a video uh, that's a conversation between our bishop and Dr. Jessica Price, who's the conference Abundant Health Coordinator. Um, she has a lot of good comments as to how we might reopen in this time, and it might be nice for you guys to see a familiar voice uh, from someone you haven't seen in a while. So I, I encourage you to go watch that. Now, if you'll join me in the opening prayer. Risen Christ, you prepare a place for us in your Father's house. Draw us more deeply into yourself through scripture read, water splashed, bread broken, wine poured, so that when our hearts are troubled, we will know you more completely as the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Our psalm reading this morning is from Psalm 31, verses 1 through 5, and then 15 through 16. I can get it open here. Hear these words from the psalmist. I take refuge in you, Lord. Please never let me be put to shame. Rescue me by your righteousness. Listen closely to me. Deliver me quickly. Be a rock that protects me. You are a strong fortress that saves me. You are definitely my rock and my fortress. Guide and lead me for the sake of your good name. Get me out of this net that's been set for me, because you are my protective fortress. I entrust my spirit into your hands, you, Lord God of faithfulness. You have saved me. My future is in your hands. Don't hand me over to my enemies, to all who are out to get me. Shine your face on your servant. Save me by your faithful love. You join me now in confession of sin as we lift our hearts up to this God who is our rock, our redeemer, our fortress. Holy One. You are our fortress and our rock, the foundation upon which all things are built. You have made us one family and one people, a holy priesthood, precious 
and your sight. Yet we often pursue our own plans and ignore your designs for our lives. We reject those who are different from us and build walls that separate us from each other and from you. Forgive us, O oh God. Tear down the barriers we have put up and rescue us from our isolation. Gather together the living stones of our lives and fashion us into a holy temple, transformed by the marvelous light of your mercy and your grace. Amen. Hear this good news. Don't let your hearts be troubled. When we ask for anything in Jesus' name, it will be done. Celebrate God's mercy and God's forgiveness. Amen. At this time, um, we lift up the prayers of the people. So if you'd like to take a few minutes um, and type in if there's anything that you have to pray about, um, and we'll lift those prayers up before God. Let me see if I've seen any already. All right. Um, nothing yet that I'm seeing, um, but I've heard from Denise Kalenda. Um, she's at, from Spencer. She's asked us to pray for Brett, um, who just received a brain cancer diagnosis and um, possibly has leukemia as well. So hold Brett in our prayers. Anything else? Just a couple more seconds. Okay. Um, of course, it's Mother's Day, um, so we'll lift up thanks um, for all of those who have been mothers to us, um, grandmothers to us, and just mother figures in our lives. Oh, I see from Susan Reed, uh, Jerry Day has passed away. We prayed for him in hospice last week. So we lift up Jerry and the Day family. Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear God, our fortress, our rock, help us to run to you. You who have always been there in our defense, you who have always been a place of safety, of security, gather us to you in this time that seems frightening this time that can seem so isolating. You have called us to be living stones, to be built into a spiritual temple. As we sit this morning in our own homes, separated from one another, open the eyes of our hearts to see what it means to be built into a, into a house for you, not of brick, not of wood and stone, but of living stones. A temple that's just as solid as anything that we could ever build with human hands, but that is mobile, that is empowered by your spirit, that is not limited by space or time or building. Gather us together, living stones, to be a house for you and a house for all people in this world. Lord, be close to us today. Hear us when we call. Hear us as we lift up before you all of those in need, all of those who struggle, whether we have said this out loud to anybody or whether this concern sits deep within our hearts whether we're praying for another person or whether we're praying for ourselves. Lord, hear the cries of our hearts and come. Save us and save those for whom we pray. We lift up Brett in this time of fear and uncertainty. Be with him in your healing power and be with him in the still, small voice of your peace. We lift up the Day family in the loss of Jerry. Wipe every tear, Lord, and 
comfort them as only you can do. We thank you for opening your arms to receive Jerry into your house. Your son Jesus promised that he goes before us to prepare a place in his father's house. And Jerry stands there now and we give you thanks for that. We lift up all of those who suffer in this world from poverty, from homelessness, from hunger, from war, And now, Lord, all of this amplified by this pandemic. Draw near to your people. Help us to be your hands, your feet, empowered by your spirit in this world. That we could be instruments of peace, instruments of justice, instruments of healing. Bring healing to this world, Lord. Cast this virus away from us. Cast away the plagues of poverty and exploitation, of racism, of greed, all of these things that hold us back, that keep your people in chains, and even now cause suffering in the world. Free us and free your people. Lord, you are a fortress and our rock. You are a more sure shelter, a more sure foundation than anything else in this world. Help us to rely on you. Help us to believe in you through your son, Jesus Christ, that we may pray the words he taught us from the depths of our hearts, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. At this time, um, our lessons today... Um, are from the Gospel of John, as well as the Epistle of 1 Peter. So hear first this word from John's Gospel. Chapter 14, verses 1 through 14. Don't be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. My Father's house has room to spare. If that weren't the case, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When I go to prepare a place for you, I will return and take you to be with me, so that where I am, you will be too. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas asked, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you have really known me, you will also know the Father. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father. That will be enough for us. Jesus replied, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been with you all this time, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I have spoken to you, I don't speak on my own. The Father who dwells in me does his works. Trust me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me or at least believe on account of the works themselves. I assure you that whoever believes in me will do the works that I do. They will do even greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask for in my name, so that the Father can be glorified in the Son. When you ask me for anything in my name, I will do it. Our next reading for the day is from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 2-10. through 10. Instead, like a newborn baby, desire the pure milk of the word. Nourished by it, you will grow into salvation, since you have tasted that the Lord is good. Now you are coming to him as to a living stone. Even though this stone was rejected by humans, from God's perspective, it is chosen, valuable. 
You yourselves are being built like living stones into a spiritual temple. You're being made into a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Thus it is written in scripture, Look, I am laying a cornerstone in Zion, chosen, valuable. The person who believes in him will never be shamed. So God honors you who believe. For those who refuse to believe, though, the stone the builders tossed aside has become the capstone. This is the stone that makes people stumble and a rock that makes them fall. Because they refuse to believe in the word, they stumble. Indeed, this is the end to which they were appointed. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people who are God's own possession. You have become this people so that you may speak of the wonderful acts of the one who called you out of darkness into this amazing light. Once you weren't a people, but now you are God's people. Once you hadn't received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you join me in prayer now? Heavenly Father, grant that the word that I bring today may come from you. Even now, build us into the holy priesthood in the service of your word. Build us into a spiritual house, a spiritual temple, that you may dwell with your full presence within us. Make us now a spiritual house. Move us, your living stones. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So our reading from 1 Peter today um, is one of my absolute favorite passages of Scripture. Um, I generally have a hard time whenever people ask me, what's your favorite passage? Um, what's your favorite verse in the Bible? What's your life verse? I don't, I don't really do that very well, but I love this chapter of 1 Peter. There's just layers and layers of Old Testament and New Testament in, in poetry form here. Peter pours out his heart, everything he knows, everything he believes, everything he's experienced, into a letter. A letter that's addressed to just a few little churches, little outposts of committed believers. Hundreds of miles away on the very edge of the Roman world. The book of 1 Peter is something like a 15-minute read, um, if you were to just sit down and take it in one piece. Uh, and yet it overflows. Just that short book overflows with so much grace and faith and more than a few questions that you could wrestle with your entire life. Peter, after all, has been living and breathing all of this since the day Jesus of Nazareth called him at the seashore. Actually, he's been living and breathing it since before his name was even Peter. Peter, you'll remember, was Simon. When Jesus called him the brother of Andrew, both of them simple fishermen on the Sea of Galilee, until Jesus caught them up in his own net and beckoned them to follow him and become fishers of people. You know, I like to think that Jesus had a bit of a sense of humor whenever he renamed Peter or Simon as Peter. Simon, the fisherman, was now going to become Peter, the rock upon which Jesus would build his church. Simon, who made his living floating on the Sea of Galilee, is now Peter, the rock. And rocks don't really float anywhere. Peter took on this role that he never would have picked for himself, a role that was totally different than what he ever expected to be. But he quickly became one of Jesus' most devoted disciples, the one we see Jesus correct so often, not because he was a bad disciple, but because he was trying so hard. Every time we see Peter corrected in the Gospels, it's because he was trying so hard. Jesus probably laughed to himself whenever Peter, the rock, stepped out of the little boat in faith to go meet him on the waters of the raging sea, and then quickly sank like a rock when fear overtook his faith. Later, as the end was coming, Peter cried out to Jesus that surely he wouldn't die because he was the Messiah. And Jesus told him, get behind me, Satan, not out of hate, but out of love, so that Peter wouldn't let himself be overcome by fear and sink yet again. Jesus demanded Peter's real, true, deep love, not 
something distorted into something else by fear, which love can so often be distorted by fear. On the Mount of Transfiguration, when Jesus was clothed in light and transformed before his eyes, Peter's fear was again changed into wonder. But then again, just a little while later, it was Peter who lashed out with his sword at those who came for Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane to lead him away for, to trial before Pilate. Fear again overtook faith in Peter. Fear distorted love and caused it to draw blood. Finally, it was Peter at the lowest moment of his life who denied Jesus three times on the night of his crucifixion. The darkest possible fear of a power so strong and frightful that it could kill the very Son of God extinguished the spark of faith which allowed this rock miraculously to float upon the sea. And he sank again down into a pain that's difficult for us to comprehend. Peter, who'd walked with God, who'd sailed with God across the plains, the mountains, the waters of Palestine, denied three times that he'd ever even heard of Jesus. And you wonder if that's something that you could ever forget. I don't think it could be. To, to, be, to have been a friend of God, to have known God when his feet were sore, when he was hungry, when he was sunburnt, when he cried in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he smiled at the children who gathered around him, and then betray him after all of that. Would you forget that? Think about what Peter carried with him. There's regrets that we all carry with us. You know, words we've spoken, decisions that we've made that still give us a pit in our stomach as we stare up at the ceiling in the middle of the night years and decades after when we think of them. But I don't know if we can imagine, begin to imagine what Peter the Rock carried with him. Sometimes all that he carried with him must have turned him to stone, making him unable to move. You know, it's really hard to read this scripture and not read some sort of heavenly vision into it, you know. It's so beautiful, it sounds like almost kind of misty, almost kind of otherworldly. All of these believers gathered around Christ, the capstone, the cornerstone, like an angel chorus. Some have missed out, some have, have failed to see the precious stone that God has laid in Zion. But here we are, finally come out of the darkness and welcomed into this land of marvelous light, peace, joy warmth in this place, in, in our Father's house. Finally, we're removed from all the concerns of the world. Peter, surely, it sounds like, is telling us about the heaven that waits for us all as believers, where those who have tasted and see that the Lord is good finally gather together as God's household. You might get that impression if you take this chunk of First Peter just by itself. But the reality is, is a lot more than that. It's a lot different. Peter's writing to these few churches in Asia Minor, what's Turkey now, on the northern edge of the Roman world. And the life they're experiencing is one of constant trials, constant suffering. All of these little churches are probably mixed communities. You have some Gentile converts and some Jews, all of whom have come, in, have come to faith in Christ, which is against all odds in this society that had no use for a crucified God and was repulsed by this supposedly religious people who refused to worship the traditional gods and worship the emperor. The Christian faith was disgusting to these people, to, to the Roman Empire. The people in the churches at these times were misfits in the communities that raised them, that nurtured them. The letter makes clear that these are people facing persecution. And we don't know exactly what early Christian persecution looked like in this time. It could have been one of the mass persecutions where Christians were rounded up and killed. But what's just as likely is that it could have been a small, everyday, grinding persecution. Nothing big, nothing climactic, not being thrown to the lions. But just Christian converts rejected and hated by their former friends. Christian wives mistreated by their non-believing husbands. Some Christians even 
executed for what the Romans called atheism, when they caused all kinds of civil disorder for refusing to bow to the emperor and all these traditional Roman gods. The Christian community that Peter was writing to was just wildly out of step with the world around it. Slaves and the wealthy received one baptism, one communion together. That was unheard of. In small ways, everyday waves, ways and massive outbursts of mob violence, the rest of the world was trying to crush these churches. These little isolated churches were under so much pressure. The Christian life was no victory march for them. It didn't feel like triumph, probably. And yet Peter writes to these people from the position of just a completely broken down conscience, burdened with these memories, burdened with guilt like scars. But with all that Peter carried with them, he's writing also from this position of just completely unshakable faith. Peter's not only telling them about a future promise, that one day everything will be all right if they just stick it out and get to heaven. It's easy to read 1 Peter, easy to read a lot of the epistles and think that that's it. That as these disciples, as these apostles are writing to persecuted Christians, just hold on a little while longer. Things will be better. The thing is, if the people in these contexts already believe and still believe under the pressure that they're in, they must believe pretty strongly in God, pretty strongly in Jesus already. What Peter is saying is that all that he's saying is promised right now. Come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, and precious in God's sight. Come to him now, Peter says. Many Bible translations use a future tense for this passage. You know, the NRSV, the NIV say, like living stones, let yourself be built into a spiritual house. But the CEB, the Common English Bible, does it kind of better, kind of more faithfully to what Peter was writing. You yourselves are being built like living stones into a spiritual temple. Being built. Right now. God is doing all of this right now. Peter the Rock, with his faith rooted in Christ the Cornerstone, is calling us to look around and watch God pull us as living stones together into something new, something strong, something that cannot be shaken. Together, we're living stones being built into the house, into the household of God in the midst of a broken world. And watch carefully what's happening here. Now, just as it was then, God is building his house with the living stones that the builders rejected. The builders of societies, economies, cities, governments, denominations, the stones that those people rejected atop Christ as the cornerstone. These misfits have become living stones. These unwanted, discarded stones have become living stones to be built into God's house. These rejected and cast out and ridiculed and impoverished by our world. Those laid aside like human rubble are the ones who are being built into the foundation of God's kingdom. You know, I'm not really big into going into the Greek words and, and that sort of thing. That's not very exciting in a sermon. But it's hard to see in English just how strange and beautiful the words for living stones being built into a spiritual temple are. This image is one that's so striking. It's really solid and reassuring. A house of stone built upon Christ himself. But it has even more to it than that. The Greek word for spiritual is pneumatikos. You know, it sounds like pneumatic, like a tire or something. Describing wind or breath, air. The house that God is building us into is a house of stone. And at the same time, a house of air, a house of wind. In Christ, we're built into something eternal, something solid, but something also fluid. Something immovable, but something that just can't stand still. Christ never changes. His love, his mercy remain forever. But Christ himself never stands still. And neither can we, as God is reconciling all of creation to God in holiness. We're being built into a house of wind, a house of living breath. 
so that we never become stagnant, never complacent or inward looking, but instead are always moving outward into the world to proclaim the mighty acts of God who called us. God calls us into the marvelous light, and we can't make the mistake of just thinking that this is some heavenly realm or someday we'll end up if we just hang on. The marvelous light is ahead of us now. When we press further and further into that light, calling all to come in with us, to come with us, to come and see, that's when we're doing the work of the church. We can chase the rising sun that God has set before us, which one day will shed light on all the world, when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. With all of this image of light, of solidity, it takes courage, it takes a lot of, it takes something special to believe that in a dark world like the one we stand in now. It takes even more courage to proclaim it when we're aware of how profoundly we fall short of the holiness that God calls us to. When it often feels like we can barely see the glow of the rising sun over the black horizon. How do you proclaim hope whenever it's hard for us to even see it? But we're not alone in that. You know, Peter came to believe he truly was who Jesus said he was, the rock. Even after he de denied his Lord and Messiah, his God, the morning that he faced the cross. Peter came to believe that he was who Jesus said he was. This rock who three days later saw the resurrected Christ with his own eyes and would later write to a few oppressed little churches in Asia Minor to tell them that we too are stones, precious in God's sight, being built into God's house in the world. No matter what we think of ourselves, no matter what the world says about us, we are living stones being built into a spiritual house. Once we were not a people, but now, now we are God's people. And resurrection is springing up within us and through us. Once we had not received mercy, but now we have received mercy beyond measure. The stone which the builders rejected, Jesus Christ, all of those in our world who the builders rejected. Jesus Christ has become the cornerstone. And the cornerstone calls upon those rejected by the world. And even calls upon us to be living stones. Filled with his breath. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you'll join me now. Um, Proclaim our faith in this cornerstone of our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. At this time, um, I'll offer up a prayer of, of thanksgiving for for your offerings, um, for our offerings, whether they're spiritual offerings, whether they're financial offerings. Um, you have all been very good to your churches in this time. Um, I'll take this moment of Thanksgiving um, to especially shout out Phil Engel from Fairhaven, um, who's also our Southwest Partnership Finance Chair, Butch Seifert, um, Finance from Spencer, and Janet Hinkle, Finance Secretary from Carnegie. They've been working really hard, um, offering of, them of their time, offering of themselves to apply for the Paycheck Protection Loans um, for the churches. Um, two out of three of those efforts have been successful. And the third one was, we're robbed there. Um, <laughs> but we've gotten a lot of help um, from dedicated servants in our church. Um, and because of their efforts, our churches are on are standing strong. Um, 
are doing very well. So thank you to Butch, to Janet, to Phil in particular for offering of yourselves. Um, your work is appreciated by all of the churches of the South Coast Partnership. I'd also take a moment to, to offer thanks um, for all of the mothers in our congregations, um, all of your mothers, all of those women who have shaped you. Um, as we offer up this offering prayer, think of all those people, whether it's your mother or someone who's been a mother to you. Um, and of course, I would give thanks um, for the offering to me by my mother um, and both of my grandmothers. At this time, um, let's offer up our prayers of thanksgiving. O oh God, our fortress and our rock, may these offerings be acceptable to you. In a world facing profound need, they seem insignificant, but we know that in your hands, even small things become great. Use these gifts and use our very lives to make this world a home where all are sheltered, nourished, and cherished. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God and Mother of us all. Amen. That prayer seems to fit this day on Mother's Day. Make this world a home where all are sheltered, nourished, and cherished. I give thanks to all of you mothers in the name of God, um, those of you who still have your children with you, and those of you who don't. Um, thank you for all that you have offered to God. Um, and now receive this benediction. Once we weren't a people, but now we are God's people. God's face shines on us. God's faithful love saves us. This news is too good to keep to ourselves. Everywhere we go, we will share the news of God's amazing grace. Go forth as living stones, letting yourselves be built into a spiritual house. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Happy Mother's Day.